Like a furry torpedo to the jugular. This is Honey Badger Radio. Radio with bite. Three. Hello and welcome to Honey Badger Radio. I'm your host, Allison Tiemann, and with me today is Karen Strawn, Hall- Hannah Wallen, Sage Gerard, and Rachel Edwards. Tonight's topic is Dr. Money and the Destruction of David Reamer. If you're interested in reading more on the things we discussed during the show, please direct your browsers to blog.honeybadgerbrigade.com. That's blog.honeybadgerbrigade.com. Before we get into the topic, we'll, pre- we'll be presenting and discussing our news and review segments. So here's Hannah with the news. James Schneider writes in an article titled, Feminizing Poverty that although men are more likely to die in famines, famine relief organizations are more likely to code famine as having a female face. In the article published on the Library of Economics and Liberty website, uh, Schneider Schneider offers the explanation that aid agencies use a female face in order to get more donations. An aid agency might focus on female victims to increase donations. But these donations would presumably be spent disproportionately on men, who are more likely to be famine's victims. Obviously, Schneider hasn't heard of the efforts by the World Food Program to restrict food aid to women since uh, the World Food Program believes women are more vulnerable to hunger than men, and that women supposedly ensure that food is uh, distributed more fairly. The World Food Program has either failed to research the issue of who is more likely to die in famines or knows and doesn't care. Either way, they've decided to put one of the demographics most at risk for starving to death, men, at even greater risk in order to aid the demographic at least risk of starving to death, women. Did you guys want to stop and discuss this one or should I go on to the next one? Uh, sure. Why don't we? Uh, does anyone want to jump in with that? With a dis- <laughs> to be honest, I'm just. I, I'm sure they've either haven't bothered to do the research and they're just running on the presumption of female victimhood, or they have done the research research and they just don't give a crap. Well, one they, of the, one of the things that I've noticed when I was uh, doing some research through some electronic databases recently is every single study I could find that talks about men always have the same introduction, that there is a lack of research. And it's just flat out, it's just a flat out not there. I mean, we're talking about just raw exclusion, and people cast this lack of um, research as a lack of problem, as a lack of a problem. It's one of those things where people confuse um, uh, absence of evidence as evidence of absence. And it's it's the same kind of reasoning that gets people to think, oh, well, no men are coming to interpersonal violence shelters, therefore men are either not likely to be victims of interpersonal violence or there's no demand. It's just one of those things where people take that attitude combined with all the stereotypes to just kind of fucking build build that, just build that bullshit barrier. Yeah, and it's, it's, uh, it's like they're, they've got to use that disinterest as an excuse, pretty much like you said. Um, And they'll build on it, and it's a self-feeding cycle there. One of the things I'm seeing here, though, in this story is that that the admission that they need to uh, feminize their advertising is is really um, an admission that they are recognizing the attitude, the social attitude of male disposability. Because why would they need to feminize their ads if people cared as much about men as they do about women in society. So either either they're assuming because they don't care, or they're acknowledging that there is a social attitude that treats men as disposable. Yeah, when I was... um one of the things I did not too long ago was I uh, got in touch with this radio personality down in Atlanta, and he was telling me about 
the in the media and the in casting in casting director and, and casting directing radio shows and all that it's not unusual for people who's anywhere close to either entertainment or advertising to just talk about stereotypes as if they are uh, recyclable products to use as if to say uh, they'll get on the phone and say you know send 50 midgets down here to this farm scene because they base their entire presumption of how people will react to a scene based on stereotypes and they will keep rehashing them because they know it they'll get a certain response and th that's no different with this uh, using the female face it gets that protection instinct going and um, I, I just want to point out again looking at the, the the research aspect the data has been available they just if if for example world food uh, food fund didn't actually look at the data before it made its decisions that's criminally a decision to exclude an entire demographic from 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 humanitarian aid uh, that's criminal negligence I mean how, how could you possibly justify it excluding an entire gra uh, demographic from humanitarian aid based on zero actual research into the issue and if they had researched the issue then it's not just criminal negligence it's malicious criminal negligence they go from manslaughter to murder so go ahead Anna. you know that's kind of a typical thing that uh, that you see from social justice warriors when they get a a demographic that they want to benefit with their their advocacy they become exclusive to that demographic and this this is something that feminists did um, over domestic violence research in this, the late 70s and I can never remember without actually looking at the file whether it's uh, 76 or 78 I'm not going to open it because it's a 400 page PDF um, but they there's a, a set of notes from um, a hearing that the Senate held on domestic violence uh, they're, they're trying to figure out domestic violence legislation back then and there was legislation passed in 84, but those hearings were attended by multiple feminist groups. Um, in fact, uh, Aaron Pitsy's name is mentioned in those papers, not as an attendee who's testifying, but um, as someone who was mentioned by attendees who are testifying. And they said there was no research on uh, men and domestic violence. It, which was not true. They, there was actually existing research at the time, and there was more research afterwards showing that men were victims of domestic violence and not just women. So it's it's kind of a common thing. They're doing it here. They they did it uh, with regard to uh, intimate partner and sexual violence. It is is pretty consistent. Well, I wanted to bring up a little bit about the way people tend to campaign. Uh, especially with design, usually what they would do, well, they know that the primary donators are also are also going to be women. So they're going to, you know, of course, put women on, well, on the materials. And usually if they're boys, it's, uh, well, I mean, if usually if it's men, it's going to be young boys and, you know, children, things like that to tug at the heartstrings. I mean, that's just straight up advertisement, but, you know, it's kind of messed up. Well, it's just usually we think of those people being the the weakest, the ones that are most harmed, usually girls, of course. That's what you would usually see most of the time. One of the, uh, but I wanted to actually uh, repeat uh, something uh, Typhon was saying earlier. It was uh, criminal negligence is actually an excellent way to put it. And um, a lot of this, uh, a lot of the very one-sided gynocentric research we hear about, say, from the World Health Organization, the United Nations, or what have you, these are organizations that are the undisputed heavyweight champions of standing by like assholes while people die in front of them. And if you, especially if you look back in history, like the Srebrenica massacre comes to mind right off the bat. Huh. Well, yeah, there, there's a situation of just like gross negligence, and there's the possibility of malicious negligence that they know that men are like more likely to be victims and they don't care. And one of the ways, the reasons why men can be more likely to be victims is that the areas in which these these um, these you know, ecological or social disasters hit hardest, um, women are often the ones who have the control over the market gardens, um, the small scale farming that would lead to more a greater chance of survival. 
uh, the subsistence farming, whereas the men usually are the ones who go out of the out of their their small acreage plots and uh, go work. And at that point, I mean, if if the the entire economy's collapsed and they cannot purchase food, the men are more out of luck than the women. And of course, there's also the biological factors that women put on more fat, thus will have more reserves. But it, again, it's it's just a, a mind boggling that they either didn't do the research or they did do the research and they don't care. Well, I, I actually think I actually think that it's not just that women have uh, slightly more control over over small gardens and things like that. It's also that when there is a catastrophe, uh, even the men in the community will prioritize the evacuation of women and children before themselves they will play rear guard they will even stay and say basically you go somewhere safe I'm going to stay and protect our home so it doesn't get burned down and completely destroyed I will protect what we have so you can come back to it um, so so you, you literally have a situation where men are putting themselves often on the line for their families and what are they getting in return for it the UN is saying you can't have any food Right, because yeah. you can't be trusted to share it. Well, here's the other thing: if if men can't be, I mean, if the situation up to this point has been that men have a worse survival record than women, and now they're giving it just to women, I mean, isn't would but logically you're going to conclude from that that more men are going to die? Yes. So they they're actually the world the world fund. Uh, fu- food fund. I hope I'm getting that right. The World Food Fund has essentially said that that's okay. If yeah. more to die, that's fine. For what reason? If more, if women are surviving in the past in the way that it was the food was distributed in the past, and more women were surviving than men, why are you changing it now to this distribution method that guarantees that even more men will die? Oh, well, and- because they can, because nobody is going to care. Yeah, nobody's right? gonna, they're gonna, they're, even if they even if they do care, most people are going to care in the sense that they think that that's a righteous decision. Of course, helping women and children, right? And it's men who cause all the problems, right? It's it's the men who are who are you know the militants, the guerrillas, the people who are making trouble, the people who are stopping food lines, the people who are you know it's the men who are causing all of the problems in these regions so therefore of course it's righteous to give all of the food aid to the women and the children um and to not give any to the men because hey men are just causing problems for everybody else that's that's how that works yeah it's but the the thing is that prior the previous method more men were dying Yes, and and probably because more men were taking on a sacrificial role. So I, 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 the logic is just is beyond me. But let's move on to the next news item. Take it away, Hannah. All right, the next news item is on female breadwinners. In an article published at Yahoo Finance titled "The Drawback of Being a Female Breadwinner." <laughs> I didn't get to read this ahead of time. I didn't even think about that. I've been a female breadwinner. Okay. Uh, Farouche Torabi writes, Today, 24% of wives earn more than their husbands. My own academic survey of over 1,000 women, half of them breadwinners, found that when she makes more than her partner, she feels more pressure to stay on top of the finances, advance her career, Maintain her income stream and deal with disapproving or judgmental family and, and friends. <laughs> so, women who take on the role of breadwinner find that being a breadwinner requires winning bread. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of going to through this without laughing. Um, Ms. Tarabi also cautions that men are five times more likely to cheat when their wife is the breadwinner no mention of how likely the wife is to cheat, and that women who work do more housework. Interestingly, she also describes how women's desire for higher-earning spouses affects their dating and marriage choices. Uh, (laughs) And also... (laughs) 
Yeah, I know. I'm it's, sorry. It's, it's amazing that this is <laughs> someone. Uh, and also that if a woman has the potential to earn more than her male partner, she's more likely to quit her job. <laughs> to quit her job to prevent just that. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. I'll, this I'll... is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is. Uh, women's uh, desire to have men work to support them couldn't be the real source of the wage gap now, could it? <laughs> well, it it is like it's, the entire article is ridiculous because she's basically, found, especially with those that t- that bit that you were you were quoting that that when a woman makes more from her part than her partner, she feels more pressure to stay on top of the finances, advance in her career, and maintain her income. Well, yeah, because she's the primary breadwinner. That's the experience of anybody on TikTok. Maybe she feels more pressure because her family needs the money. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. How is it? I'm, I'm it- going to start sounding like Karen. Oh my God. No. But <laughs> I just, oh my God. Where the hell did this person come from? Who wrote? Who 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 did this survey? Oh, wait. So so basically now she's they're, they're realizing what it's like to be a man. Yeah. yeah. Like, like, well, oh, it, oh yeah. no. Where's the study on how frequently stay-at-home moms cheat? I, who are supported by their husbands? How you know the the whole thing about the bored housewife and the mailman came from somewhere. That's not just an idea somebody made up. You yeah. know, this is or even how often the female breadwinner cheats. Like there's no there there's just they just throw out these statistics. And this is what they love to do. They just like to throw out these statistics. Oh, men are five times more likely to cheat. Well, how more likely are women to cheat? What if it's like 50 times more likely to cheat? Yeah. No, <laughs> it's it, it's like you throw out this this orphan statistic and without context you can't say anything about it. And they do this oh, repeatedly. Yeah. Well, and the other thing is, uh, they do blame a lot of adultery, both sides of the fence, on dissatisfaction with the marriage, where instead of saying, oh, hey, we have a problem in our marriage, let's work together on it, uh, the, the, the lazy side or of, of a, a marriage goes out and screws around, or somebody gets pushed and pushed and pushed until they just don't interact with their spouse anymore and they go out and screw around or maybe a little both but this yeah. is something this is something that that uh, may occur with both sexes i'm not saying this is just something women do or something just something men do but it's entirely possible that when somebody is a workaholic or when somebody um tries to have it all, as feminists keep saying women should, that maybe they start to neglect their spouse. Maybe they start to neglect their relationship. I think, and, I think actually one of the hardest things uh, for a woman who has a, or I guess maybe a man who has a workaholic spouse, is, uh, is you are, you know, like I... I Grew up, uh, a family friend of mine, uh, her husband worked in camp, and uh, and he so he was gone two weeks out of every three, maybe three weeks out of every month, and, uh, and his wife was asking my mother, you know, like, he's always at work, you know, he'll stay longer than he has to, like, what is going on with this? And my mom actually asked it, her friend, okay, so what do you do when he's home? Do you bother him about how he's not spending enough time at home? Do you give him a hard time? Blah, blah, blah. Or do you spend the three weeks that you're, you know, that you don't have to look after him, right, as well as the kids, trying to make the house as nice as possible, and then when he comes home, you're as pleasant as possible, and it's just like you were when you were first together, you know, and... Literally, this is this is really. She kind of took a step back and she said, "Wow, like the entire time he's home, I'm bitching him out and nagging him for not spending enough time at home. Like, no wonder he doesn't. No wonder he prefers work, mm-hmm. right? And she changed her her strategy, and that changed their entire marriage, right? And it wasn't a huge, huge change on her part. It was just a matter of opening her eyes and saying, wow, what am I doing? Yeah, right? That's well, counterproductive. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, I think that a lot of, a lot of uh, women who have 
uh, men who they claim aren't home enough, uh, the moment that those they start feeling dissatisfied, instead of doing things to entice their husband to come home, right? They start nagging and demanding, and you know, why aren't you home? Blah 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 blah, right? And berating him instead of trying to make home as pleasant a place as they possibly can so that he'll want to be there, right? Right. That, that's just kind of the way I see, see that whole conundrum. There's another aspect to that, too, when it is the man who is, is earning less and, and the woman who's bringing home more money, um, and especially if she's working a harder job or working more hours, um, she may be coming home and nagging about housework and about contributions in the home. And this is something that, uh, and I don't remember the article, but there was research done showing that when housework is divided evenly and that the couple uh, behaves uh, or or treats housework like it's supposed to be divided evenly and, and makes a thing out of dividing housework evenly, it leads to more divorce because they fight over the housework. So it's entirely possible that in in situations where both partners are working that that one or the other is nagging about that as well or both um but i see sage's name in the window oh yeah um i actually wanted to um mention i remember uh, karen you meant uh you saying a long time ago in one of your videos that uh even back when we're looking at infants, little boys and girls, the the boy is always uh, when the boy cries, he's a, he's expected to suck up his pain, whereas the girls are always told that their pain is important. And I think that it, that relates to this, such that the uh, the wife is expected, it feels like she's meant to nag, she's meant to express her discontent as a means to actually fix the problem because she she thinks that somebody's going to fix it for her. And um, w- regardless of how that would be implemented. Just the fact that the the nagging is there is something that is a step in the right direction in in her mind. So the I think the fact that she that simple change in perspective to say that oh wait maybe possibly this is a two way street. I think that that alone is just not something that is um, that 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 is very well taught. And I think that it, your mention from uh, your video is highly relevant here. And I want to know like uh, it, it, do you think there would be more of a kind of a widespread change in the way marriage is? Um, that in the stability of marriage, if there was just more of a even-handed approach to, I guess you could say, how nagging is just not productive. I don't know. I don't know. I, like nagging can be productive. Lord knows, uh, I don't nag my kids enough, and they have, you know, grown into uh, young adults who, um, who they'll walk past that garbage bag sitting by the door 10 times um, and not take it out because they don't feel like it's their responsibility. Nobody's ever nagged them to do that. Um, They don't tend to uh, be aware of things that need to be done because nobody's ever nagged them because I just have never done that uh, basically because nagging requires uh, a constant state of dissatisfaction. And I have never, ever uh, enjoyed or felt happy when I'm in a constant state of dissatisfaction. So, um, but, you know, so, so nagging does have its place, I think, in, in some cases. But on the other hand, uh, I think a lot of people could learn you attract more flies with honey than with vinegar, at least in interpersonal relationships, um, that... Uh, positive reinforcement is always more effective than negative re- reinforcement, and uh, and that uh, leading by example is a huge, huge thing um, that that can you know basically improve everybody's life in the household. So yeah, I think maybe uh, there there's a lesson to learn. There's certainly a lesson to learn. Um, as for the whole crying until somebody else fixes it for you, if that's how we are socializing girls from an early age, then I don't quite know how to fix it. Well, I mean, we can fix it by telling people to 
I guess, respect and care about each other more. I mean, in, in the instance of the woman who was nagging to try to get her husband to stay home with her, um, that's so counterproductive. It's just, makes no sense right it sounds like the same kind of mentality that the woman that wrote this article that hannah could barely read because it was so hilarious that she essentially found that water was wet or that uh the way i described it to the friend who who gave me a heads up with the article is uh, uh fire women discover that they have greater pressure to fight fires <laughs> when they become fire women or uh, when they become firemen um, and it's, it's just, uh, you know, sometimes one approach works best. If you want to motivate someone to spend time with you, then the best way to do that is to be pleasant to be around. Definitely. But let's, um, move on to the next news item. Cause I can sense that this is starting to wind down. Um, so I'll hand it off again to, to Hannah to talk to us about the, uh, Donald Sterling fiasco. Take it away, Hannah. This is, uh, Suey Park versus, uh, I hope I'm saying her name right, uh, versus Donald Sterling, who is the biggest bigot. If you don't know who Donald Sterling is, he's the now disgraced owner of the L.A. Clippers NBA team. He was caught on tape in a private conversation telling his black Latino girlfriend he didn't want her broadcasting on social media that she liked to hang out with wealthy NBA black players. His remarks were made in private and were recorded without his knowledge, possibly illegally. As a consequence, Sterling has been hit with a $2.5 million fine and a lifetime ban from the NBA for a private conversation. He will be forced to sell the Clippers. Meanwhile, Suey Park says that white men are the enemy. But that's not just okay, it's a call to righteous revolution. Also, Sterling's estranged wife, Rochelle, is still welcome at Clippers games, even though she is arguably a bigot herself. So, well, well I know that uh, Suey Park, uh, Rachel, did a, um, did a uh, what should we call it, a uh, review, uh, a, a scathing uh, indictment of uh, Suey Park. So maybe uh, did you want to chime in here, Rachel, with what's going on with Suey Park? Am I saying her name right? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're saying it right. Uh, Suey Park is quite possibly one of the most racist people I've ever seen. And no one bats an eye when she just just outright says, you know, I believe that white people control everything and that they're constantly talking down to me and that they, you know, that they're basically the devil. And she, she can say all of that stuff and nobody bats an eye. But, you know, somebody else says it, you know, a white man says something like that and, you know, loses his job, loses everything, has to pay a whole lot of money, and then pretty much hide under a rock for several months. Well, I mean, he didn't exactly say, I think it was just an issue of of who he wished to associate with, which is, you know, it is a bigotry and it is racist. Yeah, Yeah, I'm just saying in general, but basically anybody... If, if any white man says anything even that even smells like racism, he's done. You know what I think is um, the funniest thing about it is whenever you have somebody who is politically popular, or part of a politically popular demographic saying anything, that it could be construed as revolution or revolutionary, the fact, of, the fact that they keep using the victim narrative or using the, this idea that they're the ones that are actually the underdogs... And they could have that big ripple effect, that they could have that power over somebody else. The, the results just are just so clearly contradicting what they're saying. But they, I, I just don't understand how they're blind to it. I mean, if you could get, if you could get the Anita Sarkeesians to make $160,000 based on comments off what, Fortune, then I just, I... You know what? I, I don't know how to end this. I just I just think that we're we're at a point where we can't even tell the, the we can't even draw distinctions on causality anymore. We're in the realm of chaos <laughs> and anarchy or or uh, uh, moral anarchy. Yeah, it's a it's pretty it's pretty uh, it's pretty insane well i mean the thing is that how can you create a just society creating these hierarchies of worth and who can say what 
And then not only can, for example, white men not, well, I mean, they shouldn't, like, but he, I mean, in this case, he didn't even make the statements publicly. They were private. But, I mean, not only can, is, are they indicted for being bigoted, which is fair, they, you, they, white men are not even allowed to speak about their own lived experience without being said that they're mansplaining. So it, it's, it's a total denial of uh, the human, humanity of a group of people. Well let's, well, let's be honest. She can say whatever she wants because she is an Asian woman. I mean, really, if you added a disability onto that, she could just wear that like armor and say anything that she wanted. And that's what we've done with the way that we're allowed to articulate uh, racial differences or differences in gender. You can't say certain things. I mean, you can't even... Uh, I mean, we've, we've made things taboo. And, and if you even say it, you could just be completely ruined. There's, and there's no going back from it. And that's profoundly scary to me. And, you know, I haven't heard the recording, but based on what's been written about it, and, and even just, you know, what we read off here, I'm going to reread that one sentence. He was caught on tape in a private convo telling his girlfriend he didn't want her broadcasting on social media that she liked to hang out with wealthy players. Now, I took the, the, the race out of that, and, and there's a secondary issue there. Here's a guy whose girlfriend is broadcasting on social media that, that she likes hanging out with the players, the wealthy players, that she, she likes some kind of, you know, whether it's the nightlife, hanging out with the players, going clubbing, whatever. She's seeking them out, apparently because they're rich. But she added a modifier. She said she liked hanging out with the black players. Now, is she just hanging out with them because they're black? Because that's kind of racist as well. And it's, it's another situation there where we're allowing somebody to get away with their racist behavior or, or their they're singling out of people um, because she's her, because of her ethnicity and because she's female. And he, he's not allowed to criticize her for that. And it may very well be that they were arguing about this not simply because of race, but because she was running around with other men and embarrassing him. Not because of race, but because of other men. And got mad, recorded his statement, and decided to publicize it to get back at him for calling her out on it. That's what it really sounds like to me looking at, at, at this story. I mean, it does feel set up anyway. I mean, it, it's, it, not only does it feel set up, it just it kind of gives, gives off this, this vibe that... Um, I, first of all, I'm wondering if this guy is as racist as he is, and she's as, and this woman is uncomfortable with his position as she is. How do they even get together in the first place? How do they even uh, get their relationship to the point where that that level of vulnerability was exposed, and where he felt comfortable saying things that could get him in trouble with her at at, at that level? Well, I think that we should really take into account uh, the age here because she is. Obviously, a very a younger, very attractive uh, woman, and he is, you know, a lot older. And let's be honest, she didn't pick him for his personality. Let's be <laughs> honest. No, no, seriously. Come on, think about this. Pitching. You know, I, I'm thinking she's a gold digger. Yeah. Let's be honest. And, and she's hanging out with these, you know, attractive, muscular, you know, NBA players. And you know, he's seeing that he's like, I don't think that's appropriate. You know. You know, we're together, and and you should respect that. You know, you know, <laughs> you, you know how eerily close this runs to... Uh, this runs really close to the kind of uh, thing that Bill Burr keeps talking about, the Emmy sticking out of the box, getting fired, and the podium rolls out. You know what I'm talking about? Remember, you know that routine he does? No? no one? Yeah, yeah. Reprehensible! That could be that comedian, that comedian Bill Burr always did that. Um, was talking about this thing where there's always this set, this setup where a, guy, a white guy says, 
says a racist thing, gets everybody upset, and he he gets fired, and he runs off, and he has some like he said he he got like an Emmy sticking out of the box, and he's crying and he's apologizing, but it, it, it's funny because it's just always happening. Like it's this, uh, it it seems like they're set up for that purpose of I don't know, just to kind of rehash the story, but. I could I could speculate from that point on, but I think somebody else is trying to talk, so I'm going to shut up now. James, go for it. Dude. Oh, all right. Uh, well, first off, the call-in number is 214-666-6148. Uh, we do have a caller waiting in the wings. Uh, if you guys want me to bring him on, I will in just a moment. Um, this guy did not care whether or not they were, quote, together, because he plainly said in that phone discussion, I don't care what you do with them. You know, bring them back to place, drink with them, do drugs, fuck them. He just didn't want it done in public. He just didn't want her to be seen in public. Wow, he's such a bastard. I'm, I'm Actually, just... that's not necessarily true. Now that now that you said that, you know what that sounds to me like is it sounds like an open relationship based on an arrangement. If if he's financially supporting her, then it's a relationship for money or sex for money or the appearance of a relationship for money or something along those lines. That is not an unusual thing at all. It's just something that doesn't get talked about very much. So you're saying that uh, her hanging out with the NBA players kind of violates the trophy wife thing he had set up? Yeah. If well, that's what was going on, and we don't know, that's just speculation. But based on the sound of that conversation, that's what I suspect. That, that having an open relationship doesn't necessarily mean that you publicly screw around and, and publicly flaunt the openness of your relationship. Most people who are, are um, who have any kind of polyamorous, whether they're swingers, whether they have an open relationship, whether um, you know they, they include others in their relationship, it's usually a very private and personal thing. It's not usually party time, hang out with everybody, you know. Um, it, and it's the idea that she would be posting all of that on social media and everything. There might, uh, there might be more of a level of embarrassment to that simply because there may be people in the professional community or people... Um, in his family that didn't know that. And maybe now they do. But again, like I said, this is it's speculation. It sounds like it based on, on just the little information I have um, that that would fit that scene. But yeah, it, it really doesn't sound... He's sounding like less of an asshole to me now. Um and and it's sounding more like she was abusing a type of relationship that wasn't public, and she made some things public that uh, maybe didn't need to be. Well, it didn't. Um, didn't didn't the guy in essence give her give her rope to hang him with though? And I mean, it seems like uh, that kind of relationship is very easy to exploit as well. It's easy for the woman to exploit. Yeah. Yeah. It's not so easy for a man to exploit. Well, when I said he was, I was actually being sarcastic when I said he was a bastard. It's like, if they have an arrangement and he just wants to give the appearance that, or just, you know, maintain some of his public dignity, uh, I don't think if he's giving her that much latitude to have, let her do whatever he, she wants to with these guys uh, in exchange for just maintaining at least some public um, decorum, I, 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 I'm sorry. I, and we've 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 strayed off the topic of whether or not he's bigot, but uh, it just doesn't seem like that too much to ask. But let's let's move on to uh, the next uh, news item, and I know that you were going to say this particular one, Sage. So I will uh, I will hand it off to you. I will hand the 
the speaking stick to the resident ginger. Yay! All right. All right. <laughs> so, um, okay, I, I, I guess I could do some sort of like rain dance to get a soul finally. But um, I don't know. All right, so we got 55 schools facing sex assault investigation. This week, the United States Education Department released a list of 55 post-secondary schools which are under investigation for their handling of sexual misconduct complaints. The list includes both private and public schools. According to the department statement, being on the list does not mean a school has violated the law, but that an investigation is ongoing. Some schools on the list are being investigated due to student complaints, but other factors can trigger a review, and some schools are being investigated because of news stories. Education Secretary Arne Duncan has cited transparency as the reason the list is being released, and says that it will be updated as the changes occur. According to a Detroit News story quote, Duncan said during a White House media briefing, quote, No one probably loves to have their name on that list, but we'll investigate. We'll go where the facts are. And where they have done everything perfectly will be very loud and clear that they've done everything perfectly, unquote. No word has been given on how information exonerating innocent universities has been released, nor have statements been made as to whether that same approach will be employed in misconduct accusation cases. Holy shit. You want to clarify that holy shit there, Jerry? Yeah, yeah. It, 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 kind of, it kind of reminds me of that... Uh, that 1990s deal where they had that rapist of the month poster where they, you know what, you know that story where they took a, a random guy's name out of a, I can't remember what school this Baltimore is. Baltimore University. Thank you. Um, I remember they, that. Yeah, well, they, 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 took a, they took a random guy's a student's name, male student's name out of the roster and put it right on the poster. And you know, regardless of this, this kid is innocent or not. And it's just if most of them, yeah, 99.9999% of the time he's innocent. So th th it stains the reputation no matter what happens. And this is basically bad PR for the schools just because they were put on this list. And I think that it's just hilarious that the, that these people can't seem to tell that these accusations, these are veiled accusations that do carry real connotations on how these schools get, can relate to the public in the future, much like how individuals can relate to other people when they're facing uh, veiled accusations of a similar sort. Well, what's amazing to me is that the people who keep kowtowing to these people real don't realize that they're never going to stop. The joy is in the exercise of control and making people bend to their will. And also, like, they really do want to make it so that an accusation of, of some sort of sexual impropriety is, is essentially, that's all that, that's required to mark a man as guilty or a college man as guilty and out the door. That's all they want. They want a, a woman at any point, at any time, to say, he, he raped me, to point the finger at him, and that's it. That, you know, no pass, go, don't, pet, don't count, go directly to jail, don't collect 200. And it's, this is the world that they want. Well, and, and they're defining sexual misconduct ever more and more loosely. So that, you know, Day will come along and all she's got to do is point the finger and say, he was looking at my butt and he's out of there. But this, this whole thing, this is a, this is a blacklist like the, um, the uh, communist witch hunt days. You know, are you now or have you ever been a rape apologist? And, and that is what they're doing here is, is publicly accusing these universities and saying, well, it's not a real accusation. We just put your name on a list. And your university's name will stay on that list until we finish our investigation because you've been accused. So now anybody looking for a prospective school, if they see that list, and they see that school's on that list, that can affect the student's choice to spend their tuition money at that school. I just have a really quick question. Um, what are the criteria of schools for getting on this list? Does anybody know? Did they, did they put this anywhere? Or? What the news articles basically said is that they're investigating um, any, any place that students have complained that they're not being treated fairly under the Title IX regulations. Basically, the, the Dear Colleague letter, do you remember the Dear Colleague letter from 2011 that told them oh, to use a preponderance yeah. of evidence standard? <sighs> How can we um, ever 
a quick rundown for anybody who hasn't doesn't know what I'm talking about. Um, and then the education secretary uh, released this dear colleague letter in 2011, ordering schools uh, that that receive federal funding that that to continue to receive that federal funding in the event of allegations of sexual misconduct on campus they would be required to initiate a full investigation have a hearing and and come up with punishment at the end of the hearing um, the dear colleague letter mandates that they not allow the accused to question the accuser and that they uh, they don't have to allow the accused any representation. Also, if the accused is found not guilty, the accuser is permitted to appeal that and make him go through a second hearing. So he can face the equivalent of double jeopardy under this. Um, and they're required under these conditions where he is terribly limited on his ability to pre present any evidence and she has free reign to present evidence. Then they also have to use the preponderance of evidence standard, which is if they believe 51% that, that she's telling the truth and, and he's not, that that is considered enough evidence to find him guilty of sexual misconduct. So this situation is basically these schools are, have, have to create an environment where if a woman accuses a male student of sexual misconduct, um, he faces a kangaroo court where he's likely to be found guilty just on the basis that people are sympathetic to the female because he's not allowed to present any evidence and he's not allowed to defend himself. And if her case is so bad that... They can't find him guilty even under that standard. She gets to try again. And, uh, and they've got enough students contacting the federal government and saying they were treated unfairly. Enough, enough accusers saying they were treated unfairly that they've, uh, they've started these investigations. But the other thing is news stories. They said news stories. Um, and I'm, I'm having to guess that the recent Ohio news story where uh, there were a couple of students that had sex in public and there was a rape allegation that came out of that that was found to be completely false to the point where the prosecutor actually made statements about it being false and then feminist students protested. That school is being investigated. Um, I can't remember offhand which one it is, but uh, it was on the list and uh, that news story is probably the reason. Can, can we can we please stop yeah. saying investigated and just call it bullied into compliance? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, this is. I mean, it, it's incentivizing gynocentrism and misandry. It, it's. I think I, I have a quick question. If if some if somebody were to accuse me of sexual assault and somebody and the cops come and try to drag me to one of these hearings, can I accuse the cops of sexually harassing me and slow it down? <laughs> well, why don't you try doing a countersuit against her? Or alternatively, you know, every time you have sex on college campus, you uh, yeah, register you, you register having been raped by your partner as a man. Just, you I think absolutely just, register it. I think I'll just I think I'll just do what the feminists do and just claim that I've been raped by absolutely everybody. I can't leave the house without being raped, and then when and then I'll just see if I get a whole bunch of money. I'll just see what happens. You yeah. never know, Sage. We could all be raping you right now. <laughs> Actually, I think we are. <laughs> Almost Radio all rape. I, I'm totally raping him. I certainly have a sense of smug satisfaction at the moment, so I think that's indicative that I've been raping Sage this entire time. <laughs> yep, but that's it. We're, we're all rapists. I secretly enjoy it. Yeah. I think, I think well, you of course you do. Of, you know you do, bitch. <laughs> um, <laughs> you were asking for it. You were asking for it, dude. You are totally asking for it. Uh, no, I don't know what you did specifically, but it was indicating that you did indeed ask for it. So there you go. Uh, it was my fault. I was wearing uh, I was wearing shorts. How Nothing short were they. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, um, on that note. 
unless anybody wants to chime in on this particular topic really quick. I'm not hearing anyone, so too bad. We're moving on. Um, <laughs> Jess K. has uh, reviewed the feminist-created game, Female Experience Stimul Simulator. Simulator. Stimulator. <laughs> I, I still say the Female Experience Stimulator sounds much more fun. No, yeah, this really game does. is not fun. Like most feminist games, this, this, this game and fun uh, are in two different universes that are not even parallel and uh this is what jess k has to say about that feminist game oh look feminists are finally taking some of the logical advice sent their way and creating their own games to reflect their values instead of spending all their time and energy whining about existing game culture fantastic another feminist game has come to our attention and after the debacle that was the day the laughter shot stopped, this one just has to represent women as strong, capable, and intelligent as feminists believe, right? Let's take a look. This one is titled The Female Experience Simulator. We begin with a brief narrative. Good morning. Isn't it a beautiful day to be a woman? <laughs> oh, God. Oh, <laughs> it is. Morning. Oh, my goodness. I have never seen such a beautiful morning in which to admire my own vagina what the fuck does that even mean okay uh, all right well, well let's find out maybe it'll explain a little okay. schmitzy but all right the first task that we are presented with is selecting clothes for the day not overly complicated when we open the wardrobe we are greeted with a handful of options including jeans and a t-shirt a party dress and a tracksuit. We can choose any outfit as, as we will shortly see that our choice is irrelevant. Once we have successfully dressed ourselves, our next task is to decide where we want to go to first. The office, the supermarket, the gym, the coffee shop. Again, the choice we make doesn't really matter. Every possible combination of outfit and destination results in the player being sexually harassed, either immediately or shortly after walking out the door. From request for your phone number to obscene remarks, no matter what you do, you are the victim of sexual harassment. And more importantly, this author believes that it will absolutely ruin your day. Once the harassment has occurred, some of which is really awful and some of it which is really tame, the player suddenly runs out of options and the narrative decides for them. In response to the harassment, the narrative generally reads as though your confidence has been utterly destroyed and you are forced to go home and cry to your cat. I don't own a cat. <laughs> no, no, you I feel even worse. Your kids or something. I feel worse oh for the kids. Cat. So yet okay. again, we have an example of a feminist portraying females in an utterly weak and fragile beings who are so delicate that the simplest words will absolutely destroy them. This is not a female experience simulator. It is a fem feminist experience simulator. This does not stimulate, s stimulate, simulate the life of a strong, capable woman. It simulates the life of a perpetual victim. And that is the review by Jess K. If you want yeah. to read it, please read it yourself. Please, in a link to the freaking game, go direct your browsers to blog honeybadgerbrigade.com or if you're a feminist just stare at the screen of your computer and cry that your computer hasn't done it for you <sighs> all right go ahead karen you've been piping up this entire time i, I just i just want to say my boyfriend played it i didn't have the stomach to my boyfriend played it a couple of times and he thought it was one of the most hilarious games he has ever played uh almost more fun than team fortress 2 so, you know, I, I don't know, maybe fun is in the eye of the beholder, but he was just like, he, he was just, it was, it was just, he was so blown away by how ridiculous it is that every single choice leads to you being sexually harassed and not only to you being sexually harassed as a woman, the moment you step outside your door, but the fact that that somebody yelling slag while they ride by on their bike or somebody saying, Oh, nice! You're you're pretty. Be a shame if you let yourself go to seed or whatever the fuck he said, <laughs> right? Um, you know that that this would so devastate a woman, right? This this is coming from a man who tells me I have a head that looks like a penis all the time, <laughs> right? Okay, I tell him frequently I'm going to stab you in your sleep, 
That, that is the way we relate. This is the way we interact, right? He says, you have a tiny little head. I say, you have a gigantic, freakishly huge head. Your head is in the way when I'm driving. What the fuck is wrong with you and your huge head? I will stab you in your sleep. Like, how, how on earth can things like this bother a woman? I just don't even get it. Oh, yes. But he thought it was, he thought it was funny. He All thought right. the entire thing was hilarious. Sage has filled the the, uh, the prompt window with about a, a a billion sage 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 sage. So I think that he's trying to indicate something to us, maybe for us to stop raping him. Is that <laughs> what you're trying to say? Uh, that, yeah, I, would I would appreciate I would appreciate that. But anyway, the, we, this this my favorite part is the one where the guy where it says you've hardly made it out the front door when a teenage boy psychopath out shouting slag he spits at you and some of it gets on your shoes ew. So the thing that I love about this is the fact it, it still runs on this this idea that a woman she just gets out the fucking front door and a guy is already just waiting. <laughs> just fucking waiting for the opportunity to impress a woman. Like it's it's like it, he's been he got out of bed. He was just thinking, how am I going to oppress women today? This is what I do with my life because I have not fulfilled my penis points for the day unless I oppress women. So this it, it's so I've been sexually harassed by this girl too. I should sue her. But the I think that the, the just it's it is hilarious, and it's also uh, the, another piece of bullshit. Here is you only have five options in the wardrobe. How are you a woman if you have five things in the wardrobe? <laughs> <laughs> You're not well, with me. You with me, five. it's jeans, tank top, okay, or or tank top, and my boy's boxer shorts. My my husband's my boyfriend's boxer shorts. You're not a woman. Those, those are those are my two choices. <laughs> But no, the, the, this 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 fucking game. I mean, you go you go through here, and I mean, it's the the stereotypes that they use are are, are pretty amazing too. And the, the they come up with these freaking one line these one line. Um, I, I think they're supposed to represent the kind of things women hear all the time, the the cat calls, the quotes, and all this. And I'm just thinking, like, how do they? I'm sorry, I, I'm just, I'm at a loss for words. I just don't know what to say anymore. So I'm just, I'm, I'm going to leave it here. I'll just say the game sucks. Fuck. Well, it's, it's now we have, def, we have definite proof that, I mean, I keep getting into this ridiculous argument with feminists or feminists. I, I don't know what to call them. They say, I'm not a feminist, but I'm going to defend feminism. And it's, what are you? What, what, feminist what, apologist. You, uh, feminist shill. Feminist <laughs> apologist. <laughs> Okay, so they always say, when I say that feminism is about being a victim, it's about promoting this idea that women's social role is, is, is victim. Uh, and they say, well, I, I, don't know, I, I don't see that. That's not true. Wedge, prove it. <laughs> well, uh, look at the freaking games that feminists make. All but the women, woman exists entirely to be victimized. She just, it, it, it's, it's like, it's pornography, except not fun. It, you know what I mean? It's, it's like, it's the same brain space as pornography. Um, it's, it's circle just, jerk. Yeah, it's, it's trigger <laughs> part, like, just, it's, it, it, it's just this compulsive triggering of some reptilian emotion. Um, and it's like, uh, I, I don't see how they can't see that as being more degrading than just, Reducing, not even reducing. I, I don't. I defy that that women can be reduced down to objects because someone desires them. But, but that that you're reducing down a woman down to how she's acted upon, and all she does is react like a a, a goddamn I don't know memory foam squish doll. Um, you know, it, it, and she just that's it. That's it, her entire being. She has absolutely no spine, no sense of direction, no ability to take action. Uh, no, no ability to turn it around on these guys. I mean, I just completed a video, uh, which I, I actually described a situation where I was harassed in the street and it wasn't really a cat call situation. It was just bullshit that, it, you know, it's like sometimes people seem to have the urge to yell shit at you because you displease them in some manner by just walking past them. And the exchange, it was, was really, well, first of all, it was really bizarre and, and, and 
And it, it, it ultimately culminated with the guy saying, I'll bend you over and shove bacon up your ass or something and fuck you up the ass. Or sh- bacon in the crack and fuck you up the ass. What? And I, I, <laughs> That's ridiculous. I, I know. You have no taste buds in your and ass. Yet, you and yet oddly titillating. Yeah, oddly, oddly titillating. <laughs> it was like, well, I mean, bacon was, abuse. It's, it's a rare thing that can't be improved so by introducing bacon. I'm just saying. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, well, well, I, I actually said in, in, in one of the comments on that video, you know, like it's 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 profaning bacon for God's sake. I oh, mean, that's a waste of bacon. Well, I mean, it's bacon pretty, it's pretty, it's new. I mean, it's it's artsy. They're bringing new meaning to the term porky. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're right. You, I, I might have stumbled. It's into a waste the- if you don't like rim jobs. Uh, <laughs> uh, I might have stumbled. Into- <laughs> Right, you're right. That's another angle I could have taken, right? Uh, but I, I might have stumbled into some Dada, like a nest of Dada-ist performance artists or something. But um, anyway, I, I shut them down because uh, it, it was one of those things that people yell out. And usually when people yell something out at you in the street, you can't really make out what the fuck they're saying. So it's almost incoherent. Uh I've had that ha- happen a couple times, and you're just left. Could you come back and tell me what you just said? Like you, you just drove past and yelled something at me. Could you could you do me the favor of stopping and telling me what it was? Because I couldn't understand if it beyond flap. You know, like what is what did that mean anyway? But what when that happened, and then I just had a moment where I was just trying to register what the hell he'd said, but then I thought, wow, this is really detailed, and did, is, are you speaking from experience? And then I pointed to his friend and said, I guess you're used to that from your friend, and then I walked off and was silenced after that. But that's the point of this, of this long, ramshackling, silly anecdote, is that you don't have to just take it. You can actually talk smack back. Yeah. And What's annoying about this is that by creating these games and also recently um, the Foamies animator um, uh, Jonathan Mathers created an animation of, of the, her, his main female character complaining about harassment in games as she's gaming. Um, you're, you're creating this assumption that women can't cope um, and because they can't cope they shouldn't be expected to. And that itself is demeaning. And it's, 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 it's like reducing a woman down to how she's acted upon. And she cannot actually take it upon herself to take this opportunity to talk smack back. And I've talked entirely long enough. Someone else sp- speak up because I'm going to get annoyed at my own, the sound of my own voice. Go ahead, Hannah. Well, they're defining women as victims, but they're also using, um, using that victimhood it's it's not just that they're defining women as victims it's it's that they're they're defining completely everything about women that way um you you cannot exist outside of the victim narrative as a woman to feminists and going through that that foamy thing that is a huge huge disappointment to me i mean i haven't watched in a while um but i really used to be a fan and uh, that's really shitty, especially the attack on gamers who happen to be girls by inserting a girl gamer into the narrative. That's just, that's just shit. Um, I, I don't know if I'll be able to actually watch Foamy again after this, but, uh, I, but I don't know they, if it's, order. they just need to step up and, and grow up. And actually start, like you said, asserting themselves. Start talking back. And the other aspect of this is they're dis- defining things as an act of victimization that are not. I ended up having to finally, I went and looked at the female experience simulator. Um, I, I hate shit like this. <laughs> but uh, you know, the, the one line here, while you wait for the bus uh, to work, a man comes up and asks whether you have a boyfriend. Oh my god, that's not harassment. That's conversation. You can say, yes I do, and we're very happy together. You can say, no I don't, but uh, you know, it's nice to meet you. Or you can, you can you say, can say anything nope, in the world. You can say, no, but not looking. And, and what 
this assumes is that every guy that asks you that question is is being going to be overly forceful, going to bitch at you for for telling him no. Um, when you tell him to go away, it says like you have to be really rude in your answer. It's automatic, you, you know. If you're going to answer, go away, leave me alone. You know, you can't just say yes, I do. No, I don't. You know, I'm I'm reading or whatever. You 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 got to be rude. It's it's required. You must be rude, and and then you must expect him to be rude back because men and women cannot just have a short exchange of words without losing their shit at each other apparently and and you know the idea that a guy asking at the next line when you tell him to go away he asks you if it's that time of the month well if yeah if you ask bit, act bitchy towards him he might assume that you're in a bad mood because you have PMS because you're acting like it and and this is supposed to destroy your self esteem this whole exchange is supposed to destroy your self esteem because, you know, it just completely ruins my day when someone gets, gives me a compliment. I just think worse of myself when someone says something nice about me or, or, or makes me feel attractive. Because, you know, your ego is not at all based on attraction, right? I mean, come on. How stupid. And yet, this is the mindset. That's the mentality that they've got and the mentality that they're working off of. The idea that it's insulting. If if someone acknowledges you as a sexual being when you didn't initiate it and it and you, and your permission hasn't been given to them to notice, I mean, how entitled and and how victim mentality laden it's it's just the most one of the most disgusting things I've seen so far. And it's it's every bit as bad as the. The not rape rape simulator. Well, I actually recently got into a conversation on Tumblr about this with this random. Uh, I think she was like fourteen years old or something. Anyway, it was like this really angry poem. I said, "Lady, listen. Okay, you need to grow a thicker skin because you know this is real life. You know, people are gonna say lewd things to you on occasion." And you have to decide whether or not this is going to bother you. You can just, you know, let it go and just find it a mild annoyance, or you can just internalize it and be incredibly offended, just beyond all reason, just huddle in the corner and cry yourself to sleep at night. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, I wanted to actually add one more thing. I just kind of had a small revelation. There is one thing about this game that's realistic. It's not in the game's content, but in the game's reception. The thing is, one part that is true about the female experience is if you create something like, if you call, make just a bunch of, put a bunch of stupid links together on the most plain looking website possible, call it a game, and then say you made a game, you will get news coverage. It doesn't matter what how small your contribution is, and no matter how small the complaint might be, you will have media attention. The Florida, a Florida economic center having a logo with a tie in it, news coverage. The the Husky Wolf in that sports team logo, news coverage. It the reception gets people talking just because a woman made it. And I think that when there are, guys, there are guys out there that I know in the development community, the game development community, when I was in it for a few years, they made games and they've done, made products of higher quality, but they won't even get even an iota of attention. So uh, there is something true about the female experience such that if you create something even incredibly simplistic, you will have people coming in to look at it. And that's just, I, again, that's more in the reception of the game, not the game's content. Well, let me explain that to you, Sage. It's not how well the dog walks on two legs. It's that it's doing it at all. That's essentially what all of this media representation means. It's like, oh my god, a woman did something? Oh, that's amazing! She did something! Come, come here, come here, come here. Look at her do that. Wow. <laughs> oh, that blows my mind. I never realized they could do things get like that. Get the camera, get the camera, get the camera. Get the camera, get the camera. Don't, 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 
interrupt her, she might stop. And then, and then we won't be able to play this YouTube. You know, that's the attitude behind that. And it's so... <sighs> patronizing? Yeah, it is patronizing. As, as a person who puts a lot of effort into making something of quality um, and, and developing my talents, that is freaking patronizing. I mean, to know that all I would have to do is slap together some freaking hyperlinks and whine about some aspect of being female, of being a victim of something, and, and make men the, the and then, then I could get as much more attention than I could ever eat. You know, um, I would, anyway, we got to move on to the next topic, um, which is the main topic, the topic of the show. Um, but before I do, before we do, um, the, the call-in number is 214 six 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 one four eight that's two one four six 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 one four eight the topic is again doctor uh, doctor money and the destruction of david reamer and i'm going to hand over the mic to rachel to give us a summary of the topic <clears throat> ready rachel thank you allison on the morning of may 4th 2004 david reimer committed suicide his death came after a life of hard, hardship and abuse at the hands of Dr. John Money. David and his twin brother were the subject of an experiment on gender identity. As a baby, David suffered from a botched circumcision that, that destroyed his entire penis. His mother, fearing for his future, contacted Dr. John Money in hopes that he could live a normal life as a female. John Money theorized that gender was malleable till the age of two. As a result, David Reimer received a sex change. The resulting experiment was nothing short of horrific. From the beginning, David rejected his role as a female, ripping off his dresses and playing with his brother's toys. When Dr. Money found that David wasn't accepting his role as a female, he abused the twins verbally. He forced them to view explicit materials and engage in genital inspections. At 13, David rejected the reassignment completely and began living as a male. He decided to speak out against what happened to him after finding that the experiment had been cited as a success since 1975. Dr. Money's theory of gender neutrality became heavily popular. As a result, countless boys and intersex children suffered a similar fate as David, and even now there are few laws protecting the genital integrity of infants. Feminists continue to, to spread the idea that gender is a social construct, unaware of its origins. What happens when hard science is silenced to promote it, an agenda? And what will become of the children caught in the middle? Thank you, Rachel, for that introduction. And a, a very important question to ask and to find an answer to. Um, the, the reality is that it, what, what really struck me is that this, this particular issue seems to impact intersex and boys more than, women, more than girls. Um, and, and I can't help but note that this was done to a boy. Um, and also that the fact that this was done after a circumcision, uh, if there was a routine procedure, cosmetic procedure with dubious benefits performed on girls that occasionally resulted in a girl losing her clitoris, would anyone, <laughs> would there be any, anyone propone, uh, anyone thinking that that was acceptable, like that was an acceptable procedure or that the risks outweighed, uh, the benefits outweighed the risks? I don't think so. But uh, um, I'm going to let Sage ask, he says that he has a quick question, so go ahead, Sage. Yeah, I, um, it, the story said that the ki ch children were forced to watch explicit materials. Did the story say what those explicit materials were? Well, what happened was this. Um, Dr. Money was finding that David Reimer wasn't uh, accepting his uh, identity as a female. He wasn't understanding the differences between um, uh, males and females. So he actually made him look at, at explicit uh, this explicit book of uh, women giving birth, like naked women. Um, I think uh, even possible uh, sexual encounters in, in photographs. Oh, so basically giving the kid PTSD while he's at it. Um, yeah, actually, well, it wasn't just that. It was worse than that. <laughs> if 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 I remember, uh, Doctor Money actually had him and his twin brother uh, mimic uh, copulation. Yes, uh, fully clothed, yeah. but mimic copulation in no, the. No, they were naked. 
think um abs- I mean they actually he actually made them take off their clothes uh, partic- yeah it was it was really horrendous in fact they still have um from what I understand they probably still have the full records still at the I think it's the Kinsey Institute mm-hmm. but it's under lock and key they don't let anybody look at it so any of these pictures that are if they still exist would be with those records um, um, Dr. Money also tried to convince David uh, for years to have further uh, surgery, further co- cosmetic and reconstructive surgery, or constructive surgery, I guess, um, to uh, make a vagina and make a proper urethra. I guess David had issues with his urethra, uh, the opening being in not the proper place for a girl and uh, basically making a mess anytime he urinated. Yeah. Um, just, you know, when even when sitting down as a girl, it's just splashing everywhere. Uh, so Dr. Money was trying desperately to convince him to have a proper urethra and a vulva and a vagina be constructed. Uh, and David refused all through his childhood, didn't want anything to do with it. Uh, as far as I know, the moment that he was finally told that he was born male, that was the moment that he decided he was going to live the rest of his life male. Yeah, um, what had happened is uh, they could only really construct a rudimentary vagina at the moment, and so it didn't even really look uh, particularly like a vagina or like like normal genitalia. Yeah, and no, it didn't. Yeah, he he tried to convince him to get the surgery done. Um, I think like at six or seven, or like well, what he kept asking him, like, well, when would uh would be a good time for that? And he's like, well, oh, um, you know, thirteen or something like that. And he's like, oh, thirteen. I think that'd be too late because he he had a feeling that it, he was running out of time to get this kid to to feel like they were female, and, and it was really obvious early on that. He just wasn't accepting it. In fact, he was the more masculine of the two twins, even though he was being raised as a female. Um, and he I was, think that that might have been backlash, right? I mean, you know, you're you're being pushed one way and you push back. Um, mm-hmm. It might it may have just been pushback on on David's part, right? Because uh, because he's being forced into some to try and live up to something that he feels absolutely no comfort being, right? So Well, he even went so far as to um, ask uh, to play with his brother's toys because he, he wasn't as interested in the girl things. And he had a lot of problems in school because he wasn't girly enough for the girls and the boys didn't want to play with a girl. So he was he just felt completely out of place his whole life. Well, one of the things that that I find amazing about that is like, because I was I was a girl uh, in around that time, maybe a little bit later, right? You know, young girl, and I had never had any problems playing with the boys. But I think that I think that maybe the boys uh, that were around David, they sensed something was not right. Um, either that, or you know. David's parents and and Dr. Money were uh, forcing him to be, uh, you know, really girly, right? To present as really girly, to wear dresses and stuff like that, things that I never wore, right? And so no matter what, uh, you know, if, if they were pushing the girly thing on him, he would not have fit in with the boys. He would not have been able to just be a tomboy either. I played football in a dress with ruffles and lace on it. Got in trouble because I ruined the dress. But I I think it might be more that they probably sensed his discomfort with his situation. Yeah. Um, Is that something that, with with me, um, about the time I hit my adolescence, the dozen or so, half dozen or so, I guess would be the right word, medicines they had me on, for my asthma started to build up in my system and hit at just the wrong time and I became very very socially awkward and all of the other kids changed toward me and uh, and I'm I'm convinced that it was because I was different um, not different as a person or weird or abnormal but just because uncomfortable in your own skin. I was uncomfortable in my own skin 
And you couldn't get more uncomfortable in your own skin than his situation, being told you were not the sex that you are. And they essentially they forced him through in the, in the name of, of proving that, that gender is malleable. They forced him through exactly the same experience that we're told transgender people go through if they are forced to stay to identify as the gender of their sex, their birth sex. I mean, it, and it may, you know, it's not an experience I can empathize with because I haven't had it. But it seems to me that people who want to claim that, um, you know, people who want to support transgender rights should actually be appalled say exactly by the opposite. They should be horrified by this case. They should say the opposite of the idea that gender is malleable and programmable, um, but that instead it is not. That's, that's actually always been uh, a sticking point that I've had with the whole gender as a social construct thing, because if you are prepared to say that transgendered people are born that way, or even that they they acquire uh, their transgenderedness uh, very early in the first couple of years of life, um, or even uh, homosexuality and sexual orientation toward the uh, the same sex. Um, if you're prepared to say that they're born that way, that that there's nothing that they can do to change it, then you have to acknowledge that for the majority of people. They, their gender that they are born with and born identifying with and feeling as, as who they are is going to conform with their biological sex. And not only that, but the moment that you say that gender is a social construct and that it's totally the choice of the individual, you're justifying every single fundamentalist religious nut bar who decides he's going to, you know, start some kind of concentration camp to deprogram homosexuals, right? Yep. To to cure them of their homosexuality, because of course it would be, uh, if you look at the life, the, the challenges of being straight and the challenges of being homosexual in any culture, including our progressive culture, right? You're going to face more challenges as a homosexual than you are as a straight person. Of course you are. And so, of course, if you could cure that, if you could put someone through a six-week inpatient program and turn them straight, wouldn't that make their life so much easier? Wouldn't that just be a kindness rather than a cruelty, right? But the whole fact is, is that not only is it not a choice on their part, but that when people like my mom and dad who are conservative and who are, you know, they're socially conservative, but when they understand, when they came to understand that it is not a choice, it is not a lifestyle, it is something that you feel from a very early age and it's not something that can be cured and it's something that people can't help and it's just something that is, once they understand that, they're much more tolerant and accepting. The more people understand that it's it's not malleable, that gender and sexual orientation is not malleable, that it's just something people are stuck with, the more tolerant they are of those those people who don't fit in with the majority. Right? So I it's it's the entire concept of gender and sexual orientation being malleable is counterproductive to the idea of tolerance. Well, you know, the scary thing for me is that they're still using some of this to to treat intersex children, infants with, uh, in the ter- for those of you who don't know, it's uh, the term that they use now for hermaphrodites, those with indeterminate uh, genitalia with aspects of both male and female. And what they'll often do is, instead of just letting them choose when they get older, they will just select a sex by what, what they uh, appear to be, as close as humanly possible, and they often mess it up. And um, and before um, before they actually came out, and before uh, David Reimer came out 
and talked about this and everything. They actually used to use this to treat uh, young boys with um, microphallus, uh, which is a you know a medical condition. I think it, they don't receive enough of a hormone in the womb, and they ju it just never um, gets to be quite right. Uh, and that's that's just horrifying that they would just uh, change their sex. You know that they can still do that. They can still legally sexually reassign these infants without their consent. It, it's oh. absolutely it's it's horrendous. Mm -hmm. and this is the uh, the same group that will argue that children are not property when they they uh, want to talk about men and divorce treating children as their property because they, that way they get to use them as guinea pigs. Well, one of the things that, um, on, the, on the subject of trying to cure, I guess, or change or control the, these aspects of nature, I mean, you, you, saw, you also see this with autism. And I, I'm, I'm just wondering, what, is, what exactly is going on with this, I, just with this idea that not only are... It's just this. It's just this breakdown of the nature nurture divide, and instead of looking at nature as the premises to nurture being the conclusion, it's seen more as nurture as something that can completely overcome nature. Some, and it just goes contrary to absolutely every last possible uh, fact that could be that could be rooted in biology at all. And it just kind of reminds me of the one theme in literature that remains. And the one thing in literature that remains the common message through all of history, and that is, stop fucking with nature. It doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, yeah, very true. <laughs> um, and we're going to take pull in uh, California guy. Um, he's been waiting very patiently to talk to us, and we'll, we'll see what he has to say. California guy, hello. Are you, are you with us? Have you landed? Hello, California guy. Oh, looks like uh, he's not really responding. No, it doesn't, doesn't look like he is. Um, oh, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe, it, uh, maybe we waited too long. Sorry, California guy. Um, let's try the next caller, I believe, is... Uh, um, oh, the, ne the next caller is Kevin. Let me go ahead and transfer him over. Sure. And uh, let's, uh, uh, maybe, we can, maybe we can do another rendition of Memories. <laughs> Well, All we're right, uh, we should. No. <laughs> we, we, okay. we should have we should should have Kevin on now. Uh, hi, Kevin. Can you hear us, Kevin? Yeah, I, I can hear you guys. What's going on? Um. Well, we're talking to you now. <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. Uh, thanks so much for taking my call. I just have a bit of a question. It's a bit off topic, but I hope you don't mind. Um, I'm 19 years old. I go to Ryerson University. Uh, Karen, I was at your talk. You did an awesome job, by the way. I just wanted to say. Oh, and thanks. this past no, no problem. And this past semester, as a part of my Bachelor of Arts there, I had to take a class called uh, Media Culture, which was uh, taught by my professor, who's a quote-unquote unapologetic feminist. And one of the lectures we had was about you know women in the workforce and the media, and we learned all the standard stuff about the wage gap, female domestic violence. And um, get this, included in the lectures were Anita Sarkeesian's videos about the damsel in distress trope and uh, all that Yay. stuff. Yay! <laughs> yeah. um, oh, but, uh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. So here's the thing. It, it gets worse. Um, our program has a Facebook group, and on it where you often – you see a lot of uh, our – the classmates uh, having very polite, civil discussion about the topics that we discuss in class. Um, a friend of mine who is in the program with me, he posted in this Facebook group after we had that lecture with Sarkeesian's uh, stuff. Uh, he posted in the Facebook group expressing dissent towards what our teacher and Sarkeesian were saying. For my friend, however, expressing dissent effectively was a bit difficult for him because he's a high-functioning autistic, and he admits this too. So to make a long story short, a lot of people thought he was saying that not all sexism was bad and nothing could be further from the truth. He was just saying that, you know, while women can be misrepresented sometimes, like with the damsel in distress trope, it isn't due to systemic discrimination against women. However, the fallout from this dissent involved him being called a misogynist or rape apologist, people who were his friends dis distancing themselves from him. I felt so bad for the guy because he's literally one of the sweetest people in the world. 
And what is worse, I, I swear there's a question to this. I just need to preface it a little bit. Uh, what is worse, somebody within the group sent screen caps of this online discussion to our professor, and she addressed what he was saying uh, directly in class the next week. And while she didn't mention his name, she did it in a condescending manner saying, yes, all sexism is bad, even though that isn't what he was trying to say. This got even more people directing this crap towards him. So I kind of felt compelled to do something about the situation. We had an end of the year research essay worth 30% of her grade where we had to write six pages on one of the topics discussed in class. And obviously I chose gender representation and feminism. And what I wrote was a 15 page long essay and it included academic sources that I found through all of you, Allison, Karen, uh, Voice for Men, as well as uh, quotes from your videos to show that my ideas weren't my own. So, And on top of that, in the opening paragraphs, I stated to my teacher that I was frustrated by the way my friend was treated and that this is what my friend was trying to say. It was supposed to be an informal essay, so it wasn't that big of a deal. And uh, here's the good news. Last week, I finally got the mark back from my teacher, and I got an A on it, 80 out of 100. And I want to thank you guys for helping to guide my arguments in a manner. So to finish, I will now actually finally present my question. How can we get students at my university, or other universities rather, to start to have discussions about gender without going into an emotional fury if somebody says something that isn't so politically incorrect? Hey, um, I uh, I think this is kind of in in, in my ballpark. Um, one one thing I can uh, one thing I can tell you is that I'm also uh, first of all I'm also a high functioning autistic, and it makes me really 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 um, upset to hear that your friend went through that because frankly, uh, one one of the nice aspects of autism is oftentimes it helps you see through a lot of social uh, stigmatism right to the heart of the matter since there's it, it's kind of hard it's harder to be swayed by the emotional impressions that often come with these arguments but yeah, I said um, that. yeah the but when it comes to um, when it comes to trying to get these things out there without having that huge response that's really really hard to do and it's uh, when I was starting uh, KSU men uh, the organization on KSU that's on men's rights. The dissent is going to happen, but a really good way to um, kind of diffuse the situation and um, make it so that people are not as eager to jump at the gun and make it, uh, get really on board with attacking is to uh, uh, is to dissent, but with a smile on your face. And cre people are essentially creatures of reciprocation, and when they see that somebody is uh, in some way not afraid and not and and in many ways seems open to conversation even in dissent that actually can have a real strong effect on how the conversation plays out from that point on but in the event you end up with somebody who's like ultra militant like from right from the get go there's really not a whole lot you can do to control that but the only thing i can recommend is to always be recording grab an audio recorder grab your smartphone camera record it and then if necessary and i hope it doesn't have to come to this you might have to get security to help you you might have to actually report if you're being endangered or if you're in some way feeling threatened but outside of that frankly a lot of it is good sale good salesmanship being able to persuade in a in a, in a very um positive tone and then asserting yourself when it comes time to do so but how you do that is context centric and there's no one formula to do it and I'm, I'm, af I'm afraid that there is no one easy answer all right fair enough thank you and thank you for your call um, was there anything else you wanted to uh, address or have ask a question about in, in relation to the show topic um, well, actually, uh, well, just to try and say something in relation to the topic. Um, one of the criticisms that I received on the paper was uh, the idea, that, like the stuff that you guys are talking about, that um, feminism says that gender is a social construct. Um, that was one of the criticisms that I put on my paper. And in response, I said, do you know who David Reimer is? She said, no. I'm like, look it up. So, yeah, that's oh, wait, all um, I have to do. Well, one more thing. Um, I want to go ahead and say that in the event that you, I, I want to go ahead and commend you for doing what you've done. And in the event that you or you try to do more and you need any help or and if you need any advising, please contact me. Uh, you can just you can see me on you can see me on Facebook as Victor Zen. And my job at A Voice for Men is to is to be here in the event that you need help. So if you need any addition, if you need any additional guidance through these situations, please contact me again with any additional context, and I'll help you as much as I can. Okay. I will take. I will take that 100% into consideration. Thank you so much.
Uh, and uh, yeah, that's all I had to say. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you, Kevin. And all right, have a nice. Yeah, you, you, you too. You have a nice night. And we're going to attempt to bring California guy back on. California guy, California, California guy. Are you there? Are you there? Hello. Hello. Ah, ah, finally, great. Hello. Oh yes. Awesome. Hi. Um, well, first, I'd just like to say, um, with the show topic on um, the guy um, whose uh, sex was changed um, without his consent since he was a baby, um, that sounds like a good idea for me. I wish uh, I get that. I mean, since women get more, um, what do you call it, privileges, <laughs> I wish I was born a woman sometimes. But... Um, um, but, you know, I'm just kidding. I mean, that's obviously that's, uh, um, um, well, you know, I'm not going to judge. <laughs> the right. reality is that, uh, I, to be honest, I can understand that particular viewpoint. Um, you know, if you're a woman, you get to be a parent, a parent to your children. If you're a woman, when you get raped by the opposite sex, people take it seriously. If you are abused, by the opposite sex, people take it seriously. If you're if you're a woman, you get a ton more um, money in terms of government benefits, and uh, you you don't pay as much in taxes. So I mean, there's some some significant. And also, if you're a woman, you get to have you get to experience an entirely taxed set of genitals. So I can understand that sentiment on a a purely uh, privilege or or um, based uh, basis. But also, it, also, if you're a woman and you're standing with your car hood up and you don't look like you know how to fix it, you will have lots of people stopping to help you, right? And, and, if, and if, if you, you do look do, like you, you know how to like fix it, everybody fix thinks it, you're cool. People mm -hmm. will leave you alone, right? But if, if, you, if you're standing there scratching your head looking helpless, lots of people will stop and help you. If you're a man, uh, the... The assumption is that you're competent, and if you're not competent, they drive past you because fuck you, loser, right? Um, right. W whereas with a woman, the assumption is you're not competent, they slow down, and then they see that, oh, she actually looks like she knows what she's doing, so I'll continue to, to go on my merry way. So, I mean, like, there's, there's a lot of benefits to being a woman. There's a lot of pain in the ass things about being a woman, but... Uh, there's a lot of benefits to being a woman, totally. Okay, so what did you want to well, bring to the topic? A question, a comment? Um, well, um, okay, oh, I'm sorry, I get a little nervous, so just bear with me here. Um, I wanted to, um, I, I guess not ask, but I wanted to make the statement that um, the first news uh, that Della brought about uh, the NGOs and food, um, and male disposability. Um, I'd like to say, out in public, I refuse to be disposable, and I would never sacrifice myself for even women and children. Whoa, it felt so good saying that. <laughs> <laughs> and every, anyone who doesn't like you can kiss my ass. Well, I think I'm I, not going to. I'm not going to sacrifice, especially for this society. As I think learning about it, no thanks. I think there's something to be said for sacrificing for your own spouse and your own children, whether you're a man or a woman. Um, but for perfect strangers, why would you feel the need just because you're male? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a perfectly valid situation. Why should you be expected to to? Um... Is that an ice cream truck? Wow, that's cute. Sounds yes. like it. There is a yeah, sounds like somebody's getting out the window. <laughs> oh man, I, no, I want ice cream. Yeah. What the fuck? You better, you better, I'm not I want ice cream. Internet. Ice cream truck. But uh, oh. I, I mean, the idea that we should uh, um, that one that class men of people have this unilateral expectation of sacrifice without anything um, coming back to them. I mean, in a world where men are considered to be the oppressors, why should they have to? Uh, also, sacrifice for the people who consider them to be oppressed, be oppressed, like the the individuals who consider them oppressors. In a world, exactly. uh, men are considered to be oppressors. One man, yeah, <laughs> stands alone. And uh, yeah, and well, personally, um, after giving this some heart, I never even knew men were disposable until now. But um, now, 
I personally, I... No, I'm a guy who refuses that. I, I don't even want to be self-sacrificial. I want to die to old age and, you know, personally, let the shame thing tactics come. People can kiss my ass because I don't want to be part of this society. If, you know, a society that, no, no thanks. Um, you know, lifeboats first, I'm going there. <laughs> I, so I just, I don't know. It felt good saying that in public. Oh, my gosh. You okay, know, well, it's... It, if men could be freed from the uh, the imperative to be self sacrificing to an ex- at least to the extent that that you know that they have a greater imperative uh, than women have for it, and then there would not be such a great number of uh, of men eager to join the military to prove themselves and and go fight in some rich guy's war overseas. There wouldn't be such a need then for men to be self-sacrificing and that's that's a situation though where it would take um it would take a lot more than one guy saying i refuse to uh, be disposable and what really needs to happen is that as parents we need to start teaching our boys that they are no more disposable than girls are and and that it's not okay for them to be just expected to sacrifice themselves. Right. Yep, definitely. And thank you for your call, California guy. I uh, really appreciate you coming on and uh, saying what you said and giving us an opportunity to tag on with some additional discussion. Um, let's move on thank now you, to, to another caller. Thanks. Um, Nefanor. Uh, we'll just have to wait for uh, Nefanor to come in on the bridge. Nefanor, can you hear us? Are you on the mothership? I am on the mothership, and I am ready to probe. But you before I start... Whoa, 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 we have our... Oh, we have to I, the probing. I need to cover my but butt. Before I start... A second. <laughs> chocolate okay, caramel ahead. cup ice cream. Just had a bowl. Okay. Yeah. That's so no, I had to do that. <laughs> it is absolutely delicious. It's good. Unfortunately, I'm not sharing it. So, yeah. but uh, <laughs> what I wanted to talk about is you mentioned your, your, the whole incongruity of gender being a social construct versus what they are preaching and what they are trying to prevent as social justice warriors. But you're forgetting the one key point: gender is a social construct if it's male. Because you notice all these problems that happen. You know, the poor guy who had his gender reassigned, it's all guys that are the victims. They don't care about them. It's like they can be the experiments. They can be the lab rats as long as we don't touch the girls because they're okay the way they are. Yep. That's a pretty common theme throughout all of this. Um, and they don't even realize that this is like a – well, as, as, uh, as Karen would say, this is probably a hardwired biological um, differentiation between the two se- – the way we see the two sexes is that, you know, you can't touch the girls. They're valuable. But the boys, eh. Well, I think, I think, I think too, it's, it's, it's probably hardwired that girls are the default and boys differentiate. Mm-hmm. When well, that's where you get men. that whole thing of – Girls are complete where guys are incomplete. You know, they're, they're a mistake, according to some feminists, as we all know. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, those, those particular people don't really seem to understand morphology because uh, it, it, it's, you really can't... I, I don't even... I mean, the female is the default. I'm not... Oh, okay, look at, look at animal families and how common it is uh, for motherhood to exist and how uncommon it is in animal families for fatherhood to exist. Yeah, but right. they, and and y- 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 yes, males exist, but males exist in isolation in a lot of species, right? So, uh, well, but we're seeing more well, and more. Take a look uh, at the insects. That's only because the the, the wives eat them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And also, okay, I'm going to say one thing, and then I'll I'll, I'll let Hannah talk. She's been patient. Um, historically, if you look at the 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 uh, the what evolved. Um, they're thinking that the paternal model for parental investment, in other words, investing fathers, was probably evolved before the maternal model. And we're talking back in the dinosaur age, not well, not with mammals. But I'm going to pull Hannah on to speak because she's been waiting. So go ahead, Hannah. 
Well, I wanted to kind of respond a little bit to what Nefinor said about, you know, feminists only treat uh, gender as a social construct when it's male. I mean, it's, it's, there's, there's one thing that really drives that home, and it is the way radical feminists respond to trans women. Um, you, you cannot be a trans woman in a radical feminist community and still be considered a woman. Uh, it, yeah, because there their, was actually a group in Toronto that banned them. Lovers. Yeah, they banned them. And, and e- even, um, even women they don't like, they will deny that woman's gender. And they have to impose masculinity in order to, you know, this false sense of masculinity in order to uh, degrade the woman. And so um, they, they actually don't consider gender to be a social construct for women because uh, they consider women to be perfect. You're only switching back and forth. You're only malleable if you're male. And the other thing is they, they are treating something as an either-or situation at the same time as they're calling it a social construct. And if it's something that people create entirely in their minds and that society creates entirely in people's minds by having rules for it and everything, if it's entirely made up, then wouldn't there be a spectrum? And and not, you must be this or that? And yet, well, even... Well, you know, Tumblr tries you know, to fill in the spectrum. Yeah. Even feminists that, um, that are supportive towards uh, transgender... You either have to be completely transgender, or you can't be um, uh, gender non-conforming. I mean, I've gotten into some huge arguments with feminists about this, who have decided to call me transgender intolerant for saying that not every person who is gender non-conforming has to be transgender and has to want surgery. I'm what? serious. I had somebody call me anti-trans, which I, I, I don't know. I haven't met Uncle Trans yet. So, but, you know, I, uh, I actually okay. had somebody call me intolerant for, for saying that, that there's a spectrum. So the idea there is that they, the ones that will approve of, you know, other people's lifestyles who are willing to accept that uh, not everybody is is born um, of the sex that that their gender is uh, still, you know, ha- have this idea that you know you you can't you either have to be male or female. So they not only only want to define uh, masculinity as malleable, but they also are not willing to accept the idea of of having any. I guess they would probably consider it a taint of masculinity in their f- feminine. You can't get peanut butter in, uh, on their chocolate and chocolate in their peanut butter. It's just not allowed. That's blasphemy. How else are you going to have a Reese's cup? Yeah. Reese's. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, well, thanks uh, for calling in. Um, unless I'm And, and of course, pimp my channel, pimp my channel. I have to do that. Oh, yeah, yep, go ahead, go ahead, pimp away. I just did, I just did. That was my pimp. I love you, Nefinor. <laughs> and you didn't even give us a trigger warning. That's not pimping, you have to... Oh, actually, the trigger warning is on the latest video if you watch, because I yes, actually I specifically go into trigger warnings. <laughs> That's why I said that. Okay, so And uh, for those who didn't get it, the solution I have to all the people who want trigger warnings, four simple words, suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> Thanks, Nefinor. And for everybody who doesn't know, hasn't listened to his channel, please uh, put it in the search bar at YouTube and Nefinor and go take a listen. Next up is John. Um, hello. Uh, you have to, we have a bit of a lag here, which is always... Okay, there we go. Hi, John. How's it going? Whoa, it's going quite all right. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. So what did you want to bring to the table tonight? Well, uh, I was listening to what you guys were talking about in regards to transgender and just wanted to offer uh, some insight based on what I know about evolution in biology. 
um, which sort of kind of complicates the whole uh, concept of uh, uh, malleability, I, I suppose. Um, when it comes to reproduction, we're all apparently start off as a female template, and when the body then goes through the whole XY recognition, it flips the switch, and then brain is commanded to, you know, make a ton of testosterone, flush the body with it, and go through the metamorphosis of going from female to male. But uh, ever since I met and interacted with trans people and uh, lesbian, uh, gays, and bisexuals when I was in college, I had thought, well, what why do these things occur? Why do uh, people sort of deviate from this sort of norm of heterosexuality? Um, and on a tangent to it, then there was an old article in the Scientific American, I think it was, that talked about how the actual structure and wiring of male and female brains are very distinct from one another, sort of shedding a little truth in that it is fact that men and women do indeed think differently. And so what I was wondering is, uh, or what I was sort of hypothesizing is, what if during the psych- uh, process of reproduction, things like, uh, all right, Y gene is flipped, but not enough testosterone is produced to make ma- the brain turn male. So you got now a man that, you know, in a sense, it's a man that has a male body, but has a mind of a woman, in a sense. So it then, uh, so I was just wondering what your thoughts were on this sort of these flukes that could be taking place as you know just mutations or uh, hiccups uh, of our imperfect biology, and how a person in that situation should cope with this situation they're in, but to have a society where we're sort of forced to have these male and female roles? Well, that's definitely an interesting question. Um, Let me throw it to the floor. Does anyone want to answer some of that? Karen, let me pull you out. Well, you've gotten quiet. Maybe you're up to something. Hey, uh, is Karen alive? Oh, I'm here. I am alive, but... Sorry, uh, I was muted. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so why don't uh, anyone want to take an answer or swing at that question? I think it's true. Oh. It's entirely possible that our biology has some frailties and, and people are born with a, with a, some whatever is it part of your brain that says you're male or female is switched to male or switched to female. And, well, of course well, it's possible. Well, okay, it's okay. Possible. Yeah, what, one, of the, one of the things that they found is that... Uh, uh, there's a correlation between the length of the ring finger relative to the index finger in women who are lesbian. And this correlation is increased in women who, uh, lesbian women who are butch, right? Their ring fingers will be longer than their index fingers. And it's not because a long index finger causes you to be homosexual. It's because homosexual, female homosexuality and this length of the ring finger are both uh, caused by a surge of specific hormones at a specific stage of development in utero, right? So you, you literally have, it's, it's not just your genetics. It's also the environment that you, the hormonal environment that you have, the chemical environment that you have within the womb. It's also the environment that you have in the very earliest stages of life in the first two years, um, it is, uh, they, they have done, uh, studies, uh, sort of tracking children where they tested, uh, for testosterone levels in the womb, uh, male and female fetuses and tested their testosterone levels at birth. And then every two months until they were kindergarten age 
And they found that the level, the higher level of testosterone, whether you are a male child or a female child, was predictive of male, more masculine styles of play, right? So more cops and robbers, more using the baby carriage as a catapult uh, rather than a baby carriage, more of that kind of thing. So, I mean, like, you look at it, it's not just our DNA, it really isn't. It's about the, the in the utero environment, it's about all kinds of, of other things that impact our development when we are just starting out. So there you go. Yeah, it's, it's a very I am in agreement with you on that. Uh, I didn't even poke the stick at that whole other segment is, because it's not just about hormones um, built up in in utero, it's okay, also uh, thanks, as John. they go into John, adulthood. Thank you, thank so you thank for you. Your, uh, in, uh, your input. But we're going to have to move on now to Tucker. Uh, feel free to call again sometime. Uh, Tucker, you're on the air. You got to be quick. We have almost no time left, so make oh, it quick. Okay, well, quickly. Okay, uh, TJ the Amazing Atheist made a video. Oh, I think it was about two years ago, talking about there was a situation where this six-year-old. Uh, the parents wanted to change the gender of the six-year-old because apparently the kid was a, a, a woman uh, or a female or girl, whatever. Uh, and I had actually uh, said something to a feminist that I didn't know at this time, a friend of mine. And I was basically lampooned, or no, whatever the word would be, uh, as the social conservative asshole when I'm actually more of a conservative libertarian and I you know, abhor that kind of uh, anti, anti-homosexual kind of attitude. But I was instructed that, you know, oh, no, you're, you're a terrible person. And I wonder, when comparing this with David's situation uh, and how you can take hermaphrodites, and in some cases this happens now, like you said, where it'll still happen where hermaphrodites, oh, well, it looks like it might be a female. Well, let's make it a female. Uh, how situations like that could also be construed as, well, let's wait and see like in the case of this this uh, little girl or little boy, depending on who it is. And then there's this uh, reaction in uh, politics. We've noticed that uh, people keep pushing towards, uh, oh, well, it's it's uh, not a choice, but it actually is because, you know, we can change the gender kind of thing. Does anyone else want to take that? Want to step in and uh, actually, could you repeat your question very quickly? Yeah. Oh, okay. Quickly. Um, is there, like, what can we do to further uh, prevention of abuse of, well, if we take the situation of David where we can finally say, oh, well, it's not obviously a choice or what, uh, what have you in the future. Uh, how can we protect that from any, any further incursions? Because it seems that they're sort of having their cake and eating it too with the situation. Um, okay, well, I, I was watching a, uh, a, the one of the episodes, the gender equality paradox, I think it was, of uh, the brainwash uh, Norwegian video uh, documentary series, and they had a doctor who was actually um, an expert in uh, gender and childhood and the whole bit, and basically... The entire idea of that is to, like, you have an infant, uh, they're old enough to crawl, they're old enough to, therefore, go to whatever toys they feel inclined to go to, and you can fairly accurately predict what gender the child is going to decide they are going to be by the toy choices that they make. And, uh, but, you know, what I would, what I would say is that would be excellent for giving parents sort of a baseline of, your your child is probably male, your child is probably female, right? So, you know, go mid-range easing toward male or mid-range easing toward female and then let your child take the lead. Let your child decide, right? And there should not be any surgery done at all. Um, I don't think until your child is uh, at an age where they can absolutely decide, which would be, I would guess, in adolescence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and and like TJ was fully supporting. Oh, well, let this, let the kid decide. It's like I don't, I don't know if it's the kid actually deciding or the parents just saying, "Well, I wanted a little girl." 
So, you know, I'm going to dress the kid up like a girl and tell the kid. These kids are highly impressionable. Uh, you can tell a kid who, after a divorce, let's say the kid's five years old, and uh, the dad doesn't want to have to pay uh, child support or you know, the mom doesn't, whatever the, whatever the situation is. Uh, so the, the parent instructs the child to lie. They'll lie. But, uh, I just don't know if I can actually trust the parent on this one. Well, yeah, you know, is, who else, just, and, you know, what, what issue, choice do you have? The problem, uh, it is definitely an issue. And, and Hannah suggests we could just not do surgery on kids, kids when it isn't made necessary by a physical threat. Yeah. Unfortunately, it is the end of the show, and we are definitely getting to getting into overtime here. So thank you, thank you for your call, Tucker. And uh, I, I want to go right into thanking everyone, um, my co-hosts, for making this happen. Um, my co-hosts, Karen Strawn, Hannah Wallen, Sage Gerard, and um, Richard Edwards. Or sorry, Richard. <laughs> my apologies, Rachel. Rachel. You're changing my. You're changing my gender. <laughs> misgendering. Oh my God! <laughs> you insensitive. Without my thought. consent. <laughs> Involuntary gender reassignment surgery oh, by a radio. My God, oh, God, Allison, shame on you. Oh yeah, I deserve all the punishment that Doctor Money got, which was none. Um, yeah. But thank you, thank you all for making it fun. Um, it's always a it's always a blast to talk to you guys every week, and uh, I hope it's a blast to listen to us. Uh, thank you for the people who work behind the scenes. Phil, who creates our ad. Uh, from, uh, sorry. Europa, who does her artwork every week, um, and also Yule. Um, he's a he's a web our web comics artist, and he's been doing some great work on our uh, on our blog. And if you want to see our blog, you can go to blog.honeybadgerbrigade.com and see some of his artwork. And he's also working on a very special, very secret project that will be debuting soon, very soon. And I also like to thank uh, James, our, the person who behind the scenes does all the magic to make these shows happen. And finally, I want to thank our audience. And since you've stayed with us so far, please consider sticking with us a bit more and donating to help us spread our evil message of equality for men and only equality for women. Donations can be made on our website at www.honeybadgerbrigade.com. That's www.honeybadgerbrigade.com. Every dollar goes to spreading e the evil message uh, that men matter and shouldn't be treated as disposable. And it's that time again. Time to say goodnight. See we you next week. Meet again. And also, um, <laughs> if we get approved, you'll be able to see. You'll be able to uh, find our our podcast on iTunes. Just search for our name, Honey Badger Radio. Good night. This is Honey Badger Radio, reminding you to take the red.